Philosophy never is all that joyful of venture to partake on. The long texts, dry passages, and insufferable points of departure to prove some point or another that only the author would appear to care about serves little happiness in the process. However, for the most part, philosophers generally attempt to conclude on some sort of hopeful image or word of advice, something that they think would be good. Despite the miserable presentation of most philosophical texts, there still usually remains something that tells us that nothing is necessarily lost. And then there's Max Stirner, the philosopher who rejected morality, saw people as objects to be manipulated, and supported a world where killing babies was justified. Surely he was wrapped up in overanalysis and failed to see the consequences of his ideas, right? However, even regarding this, he wrote that even if he knew his ideas would lead to the bloodiest wars and the fall of many generations, he would still share them. What's up with this guy? This video is brought to you by The Ridge Wallet. It's light, sleek, and industrial. It doesn't fold or awkwardly bulge in your back pocket, and it seriously changed my whole pocket situation. Most people are still using wallets designed in the 90s, carrying around old receipts, pictures of their ex, and gift cards in an unorganized mess. Not the Ridge Wallet, though. This wallet holds up to 12 cards, plus room for cash, and there's over 30 colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. The durable material means each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty, you could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. If this wasn't enough to win you over yet, check out their 30,000 five-star reviews. The Ridge team is so confident that you'll like it that they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. You can send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash sisyphus. That's ridge.com slash sisyphus and use code sisyphus. Link in description. A miserable philosopher requires a miserable life, and Stirner's was no exception. Born in 1806 to a lower middle class Bavarian family, he was originally named Johann Caspar Schmidt until he was given the nickname Stirner due to his gigantic forehead. His father died from tuberculosis while he was young, leaving Stirner, an only child, to take care of the rapidly deteriorating mental health of his mother all by himself. Well, at the University of Berlin, Stirner attended lectures by Hegel, mostly surrounding the topics of the history of philosophy, religion, and, importantly, the subjective spirit. He graduated with very little academic distinction. Stirner would then go on to work 18 months unpaid as a Latin teacher. He would also get married to Agnes Butz, his first but not last wife. He told a friend that after seeing Agnes naked for the first time, he could no longer touch her again. She would later die of complications after giving birth to a stillborn child. Stirner somehow found himself in the position of a teacher at one of the most prestigious schools for young girls. Here, he led an interesting double life, acting as a mild-mannered and gentle teacher, all the while writing The Ego and Its Own, a book that would challenge religion, morality, and even promise-keeping. Well as a teacher, he would go on to join the Free Ones, sometimes also called the Young Hegelians a group of young Hegel fanboys that would meet in a wine bar and debate. The club included Marx, Engels, and Bruno Bauer. Engels has even given us the only known image of Stirner, this cartoonish portrait. It is not known whether Stirner and Marx had ever met. In these meetings, Stirner garnered the reputation as someone who hated religion, moderation, and would even provoke fierce argument amongst the group. As he came closer to publishing The Ego on Its Own, he joined meetings less and less, knowing full well that his criticism of Bauer, as well as his critique of communism and anarchism, would make things kind of awkward. Although his book, when released, was a critical success, it failed to gain popularity or financial success. In fact, this period would result in a serious decline in Stirner's net worth. He would marry an intellectual from the Free Ones, Marie Danhart, and quickly squandered her inheritance. This resulted in a prompt divorce, and later on, Dan Hart would be asked about Stirner, to which she replied that he was a sly man who she had neither respected nor loved, and described their marriage as more of a cohabitation. He was very poor and socially isolated starting in 1847, and would frequently find himself in and out of debtor's prison, despite moving locations. 
In 1856, Stirner became incredibly sick from an infected bug bite and would die. His mentally ill mother would outlive him by three more years. His death was largely unnoticed. Stirner first argues that people are way too difficult to comprehend. Hence, concepts that attempt to generalize humanity, such as liberalism that champions man as holding rational insight, Marxism which argues that individuals are to be freely and consciously creative, or capitalism, which sees the individual as selfish in a non-pejorative sense, are all unable to capture the mysterious and ever-changing essence, or lack thereof, that defines us as a species. Stirner then proceeds to do the best he can in offering a concept that describes human nature. This he calls egoism, which sees man as both a creation, or creature, and a creator. As you are each instant, you are your own creature. In this very creature, you do not wish to lose yourself, the creator. You are yourself a higher being than you are, and surpass yourself. This creates conflict resulting in an involuntary egoist, somebody who attempts to fulfill some higher purpose. They may go to church, amass a large fortune, or cure cancer, all in the idea that what they are doing serves some higher value that is good. Stirner, however, takes on the view of psychological egoism, that all of our actions are, at the end of the day, selfish. Hence, the involuntary egoist is blind to the fact that they are simply trying to fulfill their own desires of happiness and security. They aren't free, but are rather possessed by their higher aims, for they fail to recognize their inescapable selfishness. The voluntary egoist, on the other hand, freely chooses their actions and are fully cognizant of the fact that they are merely fulfilling their own desires. Marrying their wife, donating to a charity, or cheating on their wife are all the same acts morally as they simply serve the egoist's desire. Whereas the involuntary egoist is possessed by their higher aims, the voluntary egoist possesses their goals, seeing them for as they are and never finding themselves tied down. This is an important point. Stirner does not consider someone who lives a life sacrificing everything for something such as material gain as being anything more than a one-sided egoist. He argues that one must not be enslaved to a single end, but should instead find themselves in a constant state of self-rule, he defines as ownness. This ownness entails a complete rejection of any obligations, even those voluntarily undertaken. I am my own only when I am master of myself, instead of being mastered by anything else. Ownness, notably, is considered to be Stirner's highest good. This means that he does in fact have a sort of value system. Despite being very minimal, this inclusion of a good also bars Stirner from being considered a full-fledged nihilist. One is being good when one is acting entirely autonomously. That's nice, but what does this look like? Notably, Stirner rejects almost all morality, noting that values tend to emerge from a false sense of sacredness. As an involuntary egoist, you fail to recognize, and therefore the higher essence is to you, an alien essence. Alienness is a criterion of the sacred. From this, Stirner rejects basically every institution, from society to family. Yes, he states that family commitments only lead to one being tied down. Regarding society, he entirely rejects any form of government, from tyranny to democracy, arguing that every state is despotism, by the despot one or many. Wouldn't direct democracy still work? Not according to Stirner, as he argues that even if one was voting in their own favor one day, he denies that because I was a fool yesterday, I must remain such. Stirner even rejects promises. He states that the egoists must embrace moments in which they can lie about keeping a promise. This is in order to determine oneself rather than be determined, even if that means they are determined by previous decisions that they had made themselves. What sort of world would Stirner be okay with? At first, he offers us the union of egoists, a state of the world where autonomous individuals unite in impermanent points of connection but remain self-determining. He provides two images to illustrate such a living situation. Firstly, he asks us to imagine kids who happen upon each other and spontaneously engage in the comradeship of play. Secondly, he provides the image of a man who bumps into a friend and joins him in some drinks, not because of his loyalty to his friend, but because he wants to enhance his own pleasure. Regarding love, he argues that it will continue in the egoistic future. Egoistic love allows the individual to deny themselves a certain desire in order to elevate the pleasure of another, but only if such an elevation leads to one's own pleasure. 
Even in love, Stirner gives no space for selflessness. And then comes the darker imaginings that make us wonder whether such a world will really be full of kids spontaneously playing. The egoist views others as nothing but my food, even as I am fed upon and turned to use by you. The unlimited potential of the egoistic world allows for individuals to interact with other individuals with no moral constraint. Hence, Stirner goes on to not condemn a widow who strangles her child, or a man who treats his sister as a wife. In this world, we owe nothing to one another. Everything is permitted. Does Stirner's philosophy sound like a dark and inverted version of the movie Yes Man, where simply going around saying no to everything and doing whatever you want with no obligation is hailed as a moral good above all others? Such horrified opinions of his view fail to move Stirner as he reminds his readers at the end that he does not care about the welfare of his audience. Perhaps such a dark philosophy is but a reasonable product of a man who rivaled Rodney Dangerfield and the humiliations and poor opinion Stirner endured throughout his life. Nonetheless, and without embracing his darker tones, Stirner does still provide us with certain important reminders. Namely, we should live a life full of autonomy, where we may freely choose our obligations, criticize the influence of external institutions, diversify our aims so as not to be possessed by one, and entertain the possibility that we are far from a fixed entity. But please don't kill any babies.